Uh, good afternoon. Since Wednesday, May the 13th, we have seen a 4% increase in confirmed COVID-19 cases in the city of Baltimore. As of this month, as of this morning, the city has 3,606 reported cases, 399 people hospitalized with COVID-19, and 183 deaths. I'm up here at least three times a week to ensure our residents have the most up-to-date and accurate information. So they in turn can make smart and informed decisions for themselves and their families. We remain focused on continuing to scale up our response to this emergency to ensure residents of our city have the resources and support they need at this time. While continue to leverage the wealth of medical and public health expertise here in the city of Baltimore. I want to remind residents that they are encouraged to call their doctor or 211 for coronavirus symptom screening and to be connected to a physician for assessment. On Wednesday, the governor announced that the state's stay-at-home order will be ending today at 5 p.m. Yesterday, I officially extended the local stay-at-home order for Baltimore, for Baltimore City. This means that all residents are required to remain at home unless they have to go out for an essential job or task. Baltimore City's reopening must and will be guided by the data and science. That is the only way I can responsibly tell residents that it is safe for them to return to normal activities even while maintaining so, uh, social distancing. This decision has been made after close consultation with our public health experts. Baltimore City is simply not in a position to safely reopen at this time. To get there, we must significantly increase testing capacity in order to meet guidelines established by public health experts. To date, the state has failed to provide local jurisdictions, including Baltimore City, with the testing resources we need to be able to safely open. Please believe me, I would love nothing more than be able to tell our residents that it is safe to resume businesses and other activities. But we are not there, and I would, would be negligent in doing so. Until the state steps up to the plate and, and provide us with testing help, it would be irresponsible for us to relax our restrictions at this time. Based on Baltimore City population, World Health Organization guidance would indicate roughly 2,700 to 2,800 tests should be completed per day. We're not there yet. In the most recent full cycle of testing, the average number of tests conducted per day was 571. And to date, all testing resources have come from the city of Baltimore and our local hospitals. So as you can see, there's a large disparity between where we are currently and where the CDC guidance is recommended we be at to reopen safely. I'm hopeful that the state will step up and help with our testing capacity at some point, but the simple truth is that right now, today, we need more tests to safely reopen. We also need to see a sustained decrease in cases and deaths. So far, the number of cases and deaths have continued to increase. We cannot lift the stay-at-home order until these increases stop. Today, addressing our need for testing, I'm excited to announce our new mobile community-based testing initiative. This week, the Health Department, in conjunction with site-based partners, began its mobile community-based testing in three neighborhoods, Cherry Hill, Brooklyn, and Hollandtown. The testing site was selected based on data around testing needs within different city zip codes and allow residents to attain testing through walk-up capacity without the need for an appointment or referral. The sites in Cherry Hill and Brooklyn was facilitated with the assistance of Family Health Centers of Baltimore. And the site in Howlettown was facilitated with the assistance of the Archdiocese of Baltimore and the Redemption. I want to sincerely thank all of our partners for their hard work in bringing these sites online quickly. We will continue to look for innovative ways to expand testing and remove barriers to testing. But we still need more help from the state to acquire more tests. Testing capacity at these sites remain limited and residents are still advised to call their primary care physician or 211 in order to speak with a physician about their personal symptoms and health information. I know I probably sound like a broken record because I know I do, because I keep saying the same message every week, but it's that important. 
We need everyone to stay home unless you need to go out for an essential reason. If you must go out for an essential reason, everyone should be wearing a face covering. This covering isn't for you. It is to protect everyone you come in contact with. It represents that you care about your fellow residents and their well-being. And I want to thank the majority of Baltimoreans who have heeded the warning and followed the guidance. You are the reason we have made progress flattening the curve, but we need everyone to stay focused and diligent as restrictions become relaxed. We cannot stress this enough. Avoiding hospitals and healthcare facilities when possible can actually save lives. Now I would ask our Baltimore City Health Commissioner, Letitia DeRosa, to update you on our COVID response and our work to support the residents of Baltimore. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mary Young, for your leadership during these difficult times. I also want to echo my appreciation for our partners, the Family Health Centers of Baltimore and the Archdiocese of Baltimore for their support at our newly launched mobile testing sites. As a reminder, Baltimore, City is, Baltimore City's stay-at-home order is still in effect. Please do not leave your home except for an essential reason. Please practice social distancing from others when you're out and wear a face cloth covering when entering a public area such as a grocery store or pharmacy. As I mentioned yesterday, for Baltimore City to safely lift its stay-at-home order, we need to have accurate community transmission data which requires Baltimore City to have access to adequate testing. This means we need to have enough test kits to be able to test anyone in Baltimore City who is showing symptoms of COVID and anyone else deemed appropriate for testing by the health department due to their profession or living arrangements. Extrapolating testing needs from the World Health Organization, Baltimore City would need to see an average of 2,700 to 2,800 tests per day. We are currently averaging 571 tests per day. The fact remains that not enough tests have been made available to Baltimore City, a situation shared by many other Maryland jurisdictions. Until we have received more test kits from the state, it is very difficult to gather the accurate information necessary to plan for a safe reopening of our city. Despite this testing shortage, today I'm pleased to announce that in addition to our three community-based testing sites at Pimlico, Druid Hill Park, and Clifton Park, the Baltimore City Health Department, in conjunction with partners, will begin offering COVID-19 tests at mobile neighborhood-based clinics for Baltimore City residents. As a part of our initiative to expand testing across the city, residents who are going to these sites will not need a doctor's referral or appointment to receive a test. Instead, testing will be offered on a first-come, first-served basis while testing supplies last. This week, we were able to provide over 150 tests on Tuesday and Thursday to residents in the Brooklyn and Cherry Hill neighborhoods, and we provided additional testing to our Highland Town neighborhood today with plans to expand to other sites around the city as more tests become available. The selection of these mobile testing sites is based on our analysis of testing and case data in communities, as well as access to healthcare within a community. While again, we are excited to begin offering tests at these sites, the number of tests remains very limited. We still advise residents to call their primary care physician or in the event that you don't have a primary care physician to call 211 to get information about testing based on your personal health profile. We will continue to follow the data to see where there are geographic gaps in testing and we are looking to make testing as available as possible across the entire city based on the tests we have access to. We hope to be able to expand to multiple sites in the future. Until that time, again, please continue to call your primary care physician or 211 to schedule a test as we work to make more testing available. Additionally, to consider lifting Baltimore City's stay-at-home order, our contact tracing efforts need to see full participation from Baltimore City residents. If you receive a call from a contact tracer at the Baltimore City Health Department or the Maryland Department of Health, please take it seriously. First, they're calling to let you know that you or someone you have been in close contact with is positive for COVID-19. This will include information on how to safely isolate, as well as how to prevent further spread of disease to your family, friends, or loved ones. They're also reaching out to ask you about your movements during the time you were able to spread disease and to ask about the people you may have been in close contact with. 
our team is reporting that some residents are choosing not to answer the call or refusing to provide the information being asked. It is necessary both for the safety of our residents and for the eventual reopening of our city that residents who receive these calls take them seriously. I know many folks, myself included, don't always answer the phone if it's a number you don't recognize. But please answer the phone when you get the contact tracing call. Please answer the questions honestly and be sure to provide the information that our contact tracers are asking for. These calls are confidential and we would never ask residents for their social security number, credit card information, or immigration status. Again, I cannot stress enough, contact tracing remains the best tool the health department has in the absence of a vaccine to reduce the spread of disease, and we cannot be successful unless our residents are taking these calls seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zavasa. Next, I will have Commissioner Harrison come up and discuss public safety with the city stay-at-home order extending. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We are asking that all the residents of Baltimore, all the businesses of Baltimore, please adhere to the mayor's stay-at-home directive. The Baltimore Police Department will respond to all calls and all complaints of non-compliance. Members of the Baltimore Police Department will document the non-compliance through the use of our body-worn camera recordings. And if and when we find scenarios of non-compliance, the Baltimore Police Department will consult with the city's law department to determine the appropriate violation and take the appropriate enforcement action at the appropriate time. But we are asking for voluntary compliance, and we will be responding to all calls to document any situations of non-compliance. Thank you very much. Finally, I want to take a moment to address the food need in Baltimore City. We are two months into COVID-19 state of emergency in Baltimore City, and one month into our expanded COVID-19 emergency food strategy. As of today, we have provided two million meals uh, to Baltimore residents at 249 sites. And I have personally had the pleasure of working side by side with city employees, volunteers, and partner organizations. I am truly humbled by how Baltimore has come together to meet the pressing and critical needs of food insecurity in our city. Our COVID-19 emergency food response is informed by data driven by the community and rooted in a commitment to minimize hunger in Baltimore during this pandemic. I promise that we will minimize hunger during the pandemic and that's exactly what we are doing. This has been a huge lift for the city of Baltimore. Our COVID-19 emergency food response has required the hard work, collaboration, and dedication of dozens of our city agencies, nonprofit, community, and cooperative leaders, and hundreds of volunteers. Can't leave out the volunteers. We cannot do this work without all of you. You make it possible, and you make our efforts, our efforts effective and strategic. I want to personally thank the real force behind the strategy. Our leaders and staff in the planning department, where y'all at? Raise your hand, planning department. Uh, general services, where y'all at? We're here? Okay. Um, housing, the Department of Health, Rex and Parks, Transportation, and Children and Family Success, and many other agencies. And I cannot forget our great partners at the Maryland National Guard. Thank you for all of your service and your hard work. I truly appreciate your tireless work on behalf of our residents and your dedication and commitment to our city. So thank you to all who are helping us meet our city vast and diverse food needs. Now I will introduce Tisha Edwards, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success, who is responsible for leading and coordinating the city's emergency food response. Thank you, Mayor Young. In mid-March, life changed in Baltimore and around the country. So when schools closed on a Friday and the city had to make sure that by Monday we could continue to meet the critical need of providing meals to our children, we tapped into existing meal programs for youth and older adults to distribute meals as broadly as possible starting that Monday. 
In the first 30 days, the city and its partners distributed 700,000 meals. And although this was an encouraging start, we knew we had to do much more to reach the full need of Baltimore. So entering month two of the city's state of emergency, we launched an expanded COVID-19 emergency food strategy. We are now entering month three and making rapid progress to fully implement all elements of the emergency food response starting with meal distribution. Through Wednesday, May 13th, we have served two million meals to Baltimore residents. A number of factors have driven the increase. We more than doubled the number of community and older adult meal sites and ramped up home meal delivery to older adults through contracts with Meals on Wheels and the Salvation Army. And through our partnership with World Central Kitchen, we are able to provide meals to children, adults, and families at 10 schools during the week and downtown on Saturdays. This Saturday, World Central Kitchen will expand its reach into the community with additional sites at Baltimore City Community College on the west side and Johns Hopkins University Eastern High School in East Baltimore. In terms of food distribution, our 30 pounds of shelf-stable grocery boxes are by far the most sought-after food resource. We are committed to distributing 70,000 of the grocery boxes from April through June. We have already distributed 15,000 boxes to date, and we will continue to make deliveries every week. The Maryland National Guard provides critical logistical support by delivering the boxes to our public distribution sites. And now, through a new partnership with Amazon, we can deliver boxes to residents who are homebound due to COVID-19 at no cost to the city. Amazon has 7,000 Maryland employees. The majority are Baltimore residents. In the last two months, Amazon has hired more than 7,600 temporary employees across the state to meet the growing delivery demand. I am happy to say that we have with us here today the site leader of Amazon's Baltimore City Fulfillment Center. He's going to share a few words. I am, it is my pleasure to introduce Harkirat Serene. Come on up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Harkirat Serene, and I'm proud to be here today to represent all of the Amazon employees who work across Maryland, uh, including the 7,000 full and part-time employees that we've hired in the past two months to meet the increase in demand due to COVID-19. Amazon is committed to giving back to the communities where our associates live and work. We believe that every member of the Baltimore community deserves access to necessities like food, shelter, and other resources to achieve their best futures. We're thankful for the opportunity to partner with Mayor Young, the City of Baltimore, and Maryland Food Bank, and the ability to utilize our Amazon Flex delivery network to get prepackaged foods and shelf-stable groceries directly to Baltimore residents who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Over the past few years, we've been honored to support multiple organizations who call Charm City home, including Maryland Food Bank, United Way of Central Maryland, Journey Home, Baltimore City Public Schools, Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital, and the Maryland SPCA, to name a few. As COVID-19 has impacted our community, our top priority is the well-being and safety of our employees, communities, and customers. We're working very closely with community leaders and government officials to help those who are most affected with the health and social impacts of the virus. Since the beginning of March, Amazon has donated more than 17,000 items to organizations like the Bee Gaddy Family Center, the Boys and Girls Club, the Movement Team, and the United Way of Central Maryland, just to name a few. 
We have donated more than 4,000 items, including 6,500 pounds of pet food to the Maryland Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, supporting more than 500 pets during the pandemic. At Amazon, we are proud of the special relationship we've built with the Maryland Food Bank. From our $30,000 donation to support their food pantries in schools, to donating 2,500 MREs to the Maryland Food Bank and other local nonprofits, to the hundreds of thousands of pounds of food that we donate each year, it's an honor to support their mission to lead the movement and nurture the belief that together we can improve the lives of Marylanders by ending hunger. Since March, we have donated more than 25,000 pounds of food to the Maryland Food Bank, and we will continue to support their efforts in this community and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Serene, for helping us reach our most vulnerable residents. Thanks to another set of partnership, we will also begin distributing produce boxes. Starting tomorrow, we will distribute 14,000 produce boxes a week across 45 community sites. These 24 pounds of U.S. grown fruits and vegetables complement our shelf-stable grocery boxes. We're able to do this, again, at no cost to the city. Thanks to the Farmers to Families Food Box Initiative, a USDA-funded opportunity with wholesale produce distributors, coastal Sunbelt Produce, and the common market. Urban agriculture is a vital component of the food strategy. We are committed to strengthening the local supply chain capacity during and after this pandemic. We're also grateful to announce that 20 urban farms are now receiving support for supplies and infrastructure. Finally, we are continuing to build out our food retail program, and we look forward to sharing more about this exciting effort soon. So that's how we're doing, and we are expanding our reach. Our effort to date has been to reach as many people as possible as through, through many channels as possible. We truly are feeding Baltimore, and we will continue our work as the full impact of the pandemic is unknown. I want to thank you, Mayor Young, for your direction and support as we have worked to stand up this far-reaching and hugely collaborative effort. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the World Central Kitchen sites. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tisha McGain, and again, thank you to all the staff, partners, and volunteers who are helping to feed Baltimore City residents at this time. Uh, we will take a few questions at this time. Um, personally, I don't think it's going to be a nail in the coffin. Uh, what I'm charged with is protecting the lives and safety of the residents of Baltimore City and while also caring for our business partners. So some of the small businesses, um, you know, we had Goldman Sachs and Lindsay that came up with a $10 million uh, grant um, and loan program that's probably going to be forgivable. And then we did $5 million through um, our own efforts as the city of Baltimore to help those small businesses. Um, and we have created um, a small a COVID-19 small business task force that's chaired by, um, jointly chaired by Shalonda Stokes and Councilman um, Eric Costello. So we're doing everything we can to reach out to our businesses and because and, we're all suffering all over the world, uh, not just here in the city of Baltimore. And um, as much as we can help our businesses, we want to do that. And we're working with some of our manufacturers who are producing PPEs for us. So we are um, helping our businesses. But our, my main um, objective is the safety of the citizens of Baltimore. You just heard me uh, say that um, deaths are rising, um, more people are being affected, um, you know, infected. So we have to make sure that we follow the advice of our healthcare professionals. I'm quite sure you read what Johns Hopkins experts have already said about opening too soon. 
It was my understanding that the reason the Pimlico and other sites were drive up was to prevent, uh, you know, big crowds there. What kind of steps are being done at these community mobile sites to make sure that people who are potentially symptomatic are not congregating in, in one space? Well, I was at a, a, a space before I, um, that the health commissioner come out in Hollandtown, and they were all six feet apart. They was practicing social distancing. So people are paying attention, and they are doing what they're supposed to do. So I would echo uh, what Mayor Young said. So for the most part, folks are practicing social distancing. Um, we did notify uh, the local uh, police district just for situational awareness if we were concerned about crowd control. Um, we also appreciate the partnership that we have with the Office of Emergency Management, um, who supports with, with logistics and planning as well. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be safe.